but thank you for being here today. As Alex said, um, m most of my work over the years has been working with teams and organizations and helping to unleash, you know, potential that tends to be dormant in organizations. And, and I've prided myself on being able to be a part of doing that uh, in tech companies all the way to uh, international NGOs. And so um, we're excited and we continue to partner with lots of different organizations. And, and today it's great to just talk about what does it look like to design uh, for genius and, and how do we do that in an organization. One of the things I'm going to touch on as a part of this process is just recognizing that um, it's not in a vacuum. So there is no prescription to what we're about to talk about. So I'm not going to give you a list of five things to do on how you design for genius. What we're going to do is talk about the framework that we've designed as a means to help you uh, design what makes culturally, what's, what's culturally relevant to your organization and to the context of the kind of business that you're in. And, and that's really core to the, the work that uh, In Rhythm does. So we, we see this as a journey. So I throw this slide on there as a means to just remind us that, you know, we're on a path and, and it is all about what we consider living systems. And living systems are at the heart of, you know, life. And what we talk about is what does it look like for us to design with life in mind? And that's really the heart of how we get to understanding genius and what it looks like in organizations. And that is, we believe every individual brings something unique uh, from their passions, their, their purpose, their experiences, and we want to find ways to unleash that in organizations. And, uh, and we believe when we don't do that, we get disengagement. And, and most people are not being able to bring their full person uh, to the work that they're doing as they're looking to do that in the context of their roles. So we're going to dive into that and uh, we'll open it up for questions uh, later down in the process, but uh, we'll, we'll dive into the work. So in terms of expectations, uh, we're going to cover a little bit of the framework that I just talked about. Uh, and use that as a means to help us understand and help you understand our approach to design and development. But then we're also going to dive deeply into what does it look like when we're um, considering genius as a means to um, design within organizations. I, I wanted to begin with this quote because I think it's a powerful image. Uh, Einstein said, everybody's Everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. And um, I don't know how that lands with you, but it is incredibly powerful for me because I feel like there are a lot of people who have so much to offer in organizations or in teams or in the context of partnerships or collaborations, and they're a fish out of water because it's not designed to be able to bring out that genius. It's designed to be able to treat them as something that they're not. And, and I want us to just rethink, not, not for the purposes of changing the purpose of an organization, but to enable the purpose of the organization through being able to unleash that genius. And so I want people who are, are um, fish to be fish and to thrive as fish. Or if you are all about, you know, um, working in a way that utilizes your giftedness, your genius that's different than the organization you're in, then I encourage you to find the organization that fits you. Um, so our process here is just really to encourage uh, this idea of uh, understanding what it is and who people are so that we can design with that in mind. So to give you a sense of what that means for us in terms of how we see that within organizations, I just wanted to make sure that it was clear that we see organizations as a living, evolving, and naturally functioning environment. So we, we see it as living. We don't see it as static. We see it as something that um, we have the opportunity to evolve and we can design in a way that is a natural outflow of who we all are versus in conflict with who we are. And that abundance and resilience are just recurring outcomes of that health that we're creating 
in this natural environment, this natural functioning environment. So with living systems being an underlying methodology and how we approach things, we see the environment that we're operating in as something that we can design to create those outcomes. And, and we really want to make sure that everybody that's engaging in this kind of work recognizes that the work that we're doing is all about enhancing that living environment so that we create the outcomes that we want, which means we've got to approach that differently. And what I mean differently is we, we, we have flexible frameworks around how we design with that in mind. So when we talk about genius today, it actually sits in what we call column two here, organizational health and, and under the category of energy flow. Um, for us to be able to create more energy flow in an organization or in a network or a partnership, we need people to thrive. And if people aren't thriving, we cannot achieve the outcomes that we're wanting to achieve. And, and if we do achieve outcomes, they may be short term at best and at the expense of the health of the underlying system. And so we really want to change that as a part of what we're doing. So if we're going to create uh, and help to enhance the living environment that we're a part of, we need frameworks that are flexible enough to be able to allow us to do that. So this framework allows us to understand the context that we're operating in, to really manage and to think about health as we're doing that, and then design structures that enable health for us to um, implement the work that we're all looking to do in the organizations that we're a part of. And then that outcome is that unlimited potential or that organizational resilience is a part of the process. And it's extremely practical. So when we talk about getting into the details of this, which of course we're not going to be able to do it in our webinar, uh, it's about landing it operationally so that you and your teams have the ability to be able to put this to work, not just conceptualize it. And, and that is core to um, the kind of partnerships that we form with um, um, organizations. So with this idea of designing with one's genius and this unique genius that we think people have to bring to the table, it's really important that we recognize that this is all about um, realizing potential that's dormant. Uh, we believe that the potential exists in the people that are on your teams. So now what does it look like for us to be able to bring out that genius, uh, unleash it, and then reveal that potential that exists? And that core to being able to do that is this health. Uh, we've got to be able to design around intrinsic health in organizations. So we need any, any living environment needs thriving members and thriving members need to bring their entire self, which create the conditions for increased energy in an organization. And, and that's how we see designing with one's unique genius in mind. So why do we do it? Underlying health, uh, which we just talked about. And, and, and when we think about what that needs to be to create the conditions for members to be healthy and, and create connections that allow them to thrive, we recognize that the opposite of that is disengagement. So when, when it's not, not healthy, when it's not creating the conditions for people to thrive and they're um, creating connections with one another and with uh, um, partners, uh, what we get is in complete disengagement. This is from a Gallup poll where it's saying seven out of every 10 U.S. workers aren't working to their full potential. And that poll also says it's costing U.S. organizations alone 400 to $500 billion a year in lost productivity. Now, that's not me just saying this is a great thing to think about. That's actually research grounded in the fact that people are saying, listen, most organizations are not at all designed to utilize who I am as a means to create the potential that that organization can achieve. And, and the expense of all this from turnover that, that comes from it to the incredible dissatisfaction that happens when you're disengaged and how you talk about your organization or the partners that you have all creates a negative or a decreasing energy in an organization. And we're, we're looking to and desire to change that. Now that 
we think comes from us seeing people as machines, right? So this is a great little um, image of the human body seen as, as, as in essence, gears and pulleys. And so what happens when we see um, people as machines? I think you get that disengagement. And so what we want to do is talk about these four aspects of underlying health, which is this energy flow as foundational to unleashing this potential uh, in, in teams and, and what that can do to, to support engagement, which we think can release both financial outcomes as well as just um, the uh, in, ingenuity and creativity that happens in and can happen in organizations. So when I show you this picture, to me, it creates a very different image in my mind of energy flow, right? So when we talk about energy flow, it's really coming from understanding the natural environment and recognizing that when we get energy from the sun, it in infiltrates and it's connected and is interdependent on all these different aspects to create a thriving environment. So from insects to fungi to trees to birds to the soil life that exists both um, in, and, in and around those environments all create uh, and are all tied to the energy that's flowing from, from the sun. So just think about what happens when the energy is flowing within an organization. How does energy flow in an organization? We've all experienced it. When people's energy is up, when people are utilizing what they believe is their gifts and purpose, uh, the amount of engagement is substantially higher than when we see ourselves as just doing um, this task or doing the work that we've been hired to do. Uh, to me, that's a, the, the difference between this and this. I mean, what, how do you feel, guys? I mean, I don't know about you, but how many want to be a part of an environment like this versus an environment like this? And, and that is the kind of situation that we've created unintentionally. I don't think anybody's done this on purpose, but when, when we see ourselves as machines or it's mechanistic and we recognize that we're in roles that we want to automate and we want to standardize, we then begin seeing people not as living, we see people as just parts of a machine, cogs in a wheel. And unfortunately, when we see people as parts of the machine and cogs in a wheel, the unintended consequence of that is all this disengagement that we just talked about that actually costs organizations a tremendous amount of money. And, and what it does to the health of those individuals is even worse, and we see that uh, through society. So what we want to do is figure out how we can support and help people make decisions about creating this kind of environment in the organization where energy is flowing through all aspects of it versus one where we're siloing things and we're just creating and showing or seeing people as just cogs in a wheel. So with that in mind, what we've designed as a part of this process is what we call this framework around thriving people or our increased energy flow that's tied to three key things, genius, well-being, and role. And we're not going to be able to get into all this because of time, but what we're going to talk about is genius. And when we talk about genius, we want to talk about genius in three, three areas. Purpose, so why does that person who that person is and how do we engage it and reveal it in the, in the context of them living their life. Two, their passion, which is this idea of unlimited energy. And three, what is called place or how we take purpose and passion and put it to work. Because we're not doing it in a vacuum. It's not conceptual. So what does it look like for us to take the purpose that allows us to, um, to feel fulfilled and that passion that we tap of unlimited energy and put it to work in the relationships that we have uh, in all places that we exist. And then uh, the others we'll talk about at a later date uh, if there's another chance for us to engage. But this just gives you an overview of kind of 
our process, and we're going to talk about genius today or uniqueness. So as a part of this, I want to show you, and I'm hoping this works in light of our connectivity issues today, but I want to show you this video. And, uh, and then we're going to actually do something. We're going to pause. I think the group's small enough to be able to open it up with uh, a question, but uh, I'm going to show this video that I think allows for us to um, see and hear um, energy in a different way. So here we go. Oops. Sorry, guys. I just lost it. Did the video get deleted? I could pull it up on YouTube if you want. Was it? What did it play, Alex? When it was just yes. Um, okay. it had started. And did you hear the? Uh, I don't you, know if oh. I heard. Did you hear the the volume? I'm not sure. I heard audio. You okay, heard great. Audio? Okay. Great. great. Here we go again. Let's try this one more time. Sorry about that, guys. Work. Can you turn it up? Do you know what people and light bulbs have in common? We both express different colors, have different shapes, different sizes. We're manufactured in different places. Some of us are some dim, some clear, and some broken. We appear to be very different on the outside. But the thing about these lights is there is one current running through each bulb. And in the same way, there is a singular energy running through each person on this planet. Doesn't matter what you look like, doesn't matter your race, gender, nationality, that's just the ball. Inside of all that is who you really are, energy. Don't believe your energy? Well, riddle me this. Say you have a friend named Jim, and you've been visiting Jim in the hospital until one day Jim unfortunately dies on the operating table. You say, oh, no, Jim died, but his body is still there, his race, his gender. But you say Jim died because you know deep down that Jim was a lot more than his body. He was the intelligent energy that gave life to his body. Energy is what we are. And energy has no color. It is not Republican nor Democrat white or black energy is not christian muslim or atheist energy is energy is we are intelligent creative universal energy and if we understood that then we would finally know what wise men and women have been trying to tell us since the dawn of time that we are one So what I want to do is just uh, open it up to everybody uh, in light of what's been said um, through the presentation so far this morning. How does this change your perspective of an organization if we view it this way through this idea of energy and uh, and what are you inspired to do differently as a result of it and then we'll get into some more specifics but feel free to unmute yourself and 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 share a couple of thoughts. Any thoughts from anybody? Hey, Trey, I can share a thought. Sure, thank you. Uh, so, so something in what you said um, brings to mind for me a real curiosity around what organizational structures and patterns have to shift to allow that to happen because 
you can't just obviously say, hey, everybody bring yourself to work, but change nothing else about how the environment supports that to happen. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that it brings to mind for me. Great, thank you. Somebody else. All right, well, let's just keep going into this conversation. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, and then we'll jump back into my presentation. Having challenges with the presentation here with that video. So um, exactly what was just mentioned when we think about energy flow and we think about seeing- oh, we can't yes. see your slides yet. Uh, can't see the slides. There we go. Oh, Great. we can see your calendar. <laughs> There we go. Very good. So when we think about energy flow and thriving people as a part of this, exactly what was just mentioned in terms of the current structures are not going to work. So we do, uh, nicely put, see it as a design issue. And that current organizations aren't designed to be able to create the conditions for people to thrive. And, and even though there may be good intentions, the reality is, is it's designed to be able to create productivity and efficiency, and at times at the expense of that um, genius, at the expense of the things that we think um, would be able to bring even more potential. But as we know it, and, and, and a lot of management would see it as an extremely risky proposition. So what we're, we talk about is, so what can we do to design and to think about this differently. And so when we think about it, we also think about it in terms of it as a living system again. So we think about the conventional technical system design, which is really all about a functional way of getting things done, just like it is in uh, an assembly line. And versus a living systems design where we see that as regenerative and conventional one being substantially more energy required versus the regenerative one being less energy required. And the conventional one we also see is, as being degenerative as a part of uh, the process because in a living system or in a living environment, there, it, it doesn't just not work. And I just really think I wanna stress this as a part of a process. When the machine, when electricity is not there, or the machine's not working, or the part's not working right, it stops working, right? Or not working at the level we want. In a living system, if the conditions aren't there for there to be healthy, uh, thriving members of that system, uh, it degenerates. It, it, and it impacts all aspects of life, not just that role that someone may be in. So when we think about this, we're also thinking about this uh, beyond just the role that someone's playing or the organization that you're a part of, we're also seeing it as a part of just our engagement in humanity. And that is as living beings, we need to be a part of things that are not going to degenerate ourselves. And so how can we design with regeneration in mind? So part of the process of designing something different is to recognize the power of using principles as a means for that design. So these principles are coming straight out of living systems and, and, and living environments. And so when we think about holism, we think about things being inter interrelated and dependent. Just like I showed in the image of the energy flow in a natural environment, we know that not any of those things are separated from one another. They're actually completely dependent upon one another. As water flows through a system, it, it creates the conditions for plants to thrive. It also uh, creates pathways for 
uh, for seeds to move from one part of a um, organizational or from or a um, environment to another part of an environment. And so when we think of the opposite of holism, it's silos, right? So in organizations, we've prided ourselves at being an inch wide and a mile deep, right? Our ability to go deep in things, but then in essence create separation. So how do we design with holism in mind? Because that is how we are as a part of a living environment. Um, we know that someone's health impacts their ability to occupy a meaningful aspect of their role. We know that you know, when someone is super energized by the achievements that they've, they've made at the workplace, they bring that energy back into their home. Um, but we also recognize that um, if we're going to design things differently in organizations, we need to do it mutualistically. So we need to recognize the inherent value and dependence in, in the other and design with the other in mind versus the few that may be in mind. And, and I think this has um, definite relevance, not just for how we do internal, but how we even design for our offerings to our clients and the relationships that mean so much to us. What does it look like for us to truly embrace mutualism in our design process? We see that in living systems and living environments and that there is a cycle that all environments are a part of, but it is to create the conditions for everyone to thrive as a part of that natural environment. And then we get into the uniqueness or this originality and the possibility of individual genius, which is what was uh, brought up uh, as we dive into this unique genius conversation. And to recognize that in any um, environment that we're going to design within that is a living environment, it's, there is this evolutionary thing that happens, right? And we're trying to figure out what does it look like to maintain this dynamic balance within an ever-changing environment? Uh, so when we're looking to design differently, what does it look like? But the markets that you guys serve in, the clients that you serve are constantly changing. The world is constantly changing. Yet the way that we've designed, especially with genius in mind, is still a reflection of several hundred years of old thinking. Um, I even talk about now that some of the job descriptions that people are using in certain organizations were developed in the 50s. And when we think about the fact that people are occupying that kind of role that hasn't even been rethought through or um, seen differently, just tells you that the opportunities that we all have as a means to design differently as a part of our evolutionary process. Nodal can be somewhat confusing, but it's just this idea that we want to take this um, centralized power uh, that usually exists in most organizations. And another way to look at it or think about it is what it looks like if who, who, who are the ultimate decision makers in an organization where it's usually centralized in, in the hands of a few people. Uh, and what does it look like to decentralize and distribute that power throughout an organization? where there are multiple decision makers and not just single decision makers, where people's unique genius can be put to work in decisions with clients or with team members or how resources are used versus in the hands of a few people who think they can make the decisions for everybody. Um, yes, there is some efficiency that may be gained with some of that, but think about resilience. I mean, one of the biggest challenges the U.S. government's having right now is that even our power grids are centralized. And what happens if there is something that disrupts that power grid? It disrupts so many people versus what's, what's happening with the solar movement, where when, when solar is now being generated within local communities uh, versus being centralized in these major power grids. Just another image of how we can do that from a nodal standpoint. And then to recognize that as a part of this ongoing commitment to redesigning using these principles, it's about the growth and health of all its members. And what can we do to really create the conditions for 
that growth and health ongoingly, uh, way into the future, versus just situationally, or because we've got a task we're trying to accomplish. What we want to do is create ongoing intrinsic health uh, as we do this as a part of design. And then we again create this, which is this opportunity for incredible energy across the entire environment. And just think about this picture. I would think about someone who's working in the shipping department and someone who's working in marketing and, and someone who is, you know, been a manager as a part of the <coughs> sales management process. Um, but when we see them all a part of a, a connected, dependent environment, then we find ways to, to leverage and to, to, to build off those dependencies and those synergies and, and not see us as siloed. So this helps us to be able to begin to design with um, purpose and passion and place as a part of genius uh, when we dig into the details. So one of the things I want us to do is I'm, we're going to divide into um, small groups. Um, Alex will uh, do that. And we're going to ask ourselves some questions. And, and these questions, I just want you to start with you. We're going to talk about energy flow. And we're going to talk about where this work can really begin. This work really should just begin with us. So since you're on this call, you get to do some deep work. Uh, as a part of this process over the next 20 minutes. And, and I hope it will help to create the opportunity for you to just think differently about your own genius as you bring it to work in the role that you have in an organization. So um, what I want us to do is just start off by just asking ourselves these two questions. So what are you personally willing to struggle for? And, and that fulfillment involves effort and trial and error and failure and learning. But what is it that you're willing to, to push to be able to create deep fulfillment? And then the second question is, over the last seven days, what moments have given you feelings of great love or deep satisfaction? And, and even the third question, over the last month, when you felt most switched on, what were you doing and who were you being in that process? Or even if you expand the time frame <clears throat> and just look at the last six months and say, so where have you felt most alive and electrified? And what were you doing and who were you being? <clears throat> and then the last question is, is if we're really wanting to create the opportunity for making great impact, how, how are you going to save the world? What does that look like? And instead of focusing something on just yourself, maybe it is about kind of losing yourself in something bigger, something larger as a part of this process. So what I want us to do is just take a couple of minutes, break into these groups, and uh, depending on how many are in your group, three or four people, I want you to just give each person opportunity to share which one of those questions were meaningful to you, and what was your answer? Uh, and I know that it may make you feel a little vulnerable, but hopefully this is an opportunity for you to be able to, to work through a little bit of your deep-seated purpose as a part of this process. So let's go ahead and Alex and divide into groups. Hopefully the technology worked and you guys got to meet some people and have some face-to-face -face conversations. Um, and so uh, just a recap of the, the reason why we, I set out those, that first set of questions was primarily to give you a feel of what we would actually take an organization through or a team through in just trying to have conversations deepening their understanding of who they are. And, and that, those set of questions we've, I have seen personally uh, work not to bring out something specific, but to create the opportunity for people to be open about exploring and diving into what that looks like. So just so that you know, um, as a part of trying to understand and, and dive into this idea of unique genius, uh, it's a lifetime exploring to understand what that is. And so I found that some people can really get clear on what it is, but then it evolves and changes. And so this just gives people permission to begin to 
uh, continue to ask those questions as a part of the process. So I'm going to share um, my screen one more time, and then we're going to just start to, uh, to close out. But one of the things that I wanted to be able to um, talk about is that in addition to this question, these questions, we had a, a few others too, and, um, and all kind tied to uh, that idea of purpose, passion, and place. And so I'm going to read these questions, and, but they're for you to use, right? So we use these questions as a part of our facilitation. I love these questions around unlimited energy as we're trying to really understand uh, genius in somebody. Is So what did your eight-year-old self love doing? Remember the joy of doing things for the fun of it, right? No rewards, no impressing anyone, just for yourself. And then what makes you forget to eat when you're so immersed in activity that some time passes without you realizing it? Psychologists will call this flow, right? And what can you do with unlimited energy? So when we think about passion, one of those things that we do where we do, we lose track of time, we don't eat, we do those things that um, really are a reflection of something deeper. And if you did not have a job, how would you choose to fill your day? And then also just what, what's on your bucket list, right? Um, as we're trying to understand what this is. And then when we get to place, who do you connect with and why? Because what we're doing is taking purpose and passion and we're making sure it lands in relationship, right? Because there is no siloed person, right? We're all connected as that video showed you. So what do you like to do with other people? If you could go anywhere in the world, where would it be? And what do people or play, what, what people or places inspire you? And then what is the energy you feel uh, when you are with the right person or in the right place? And so, so when we see those three together and we do that work together, you know, we'll divide people into teams and we'll have these conversations in organizations. And what's interesting, what comes back and what really turns people on, as in like that light switch, um, is sometimes very different than what and how they're currently um, working. And so we take this unique genius and then it, it gets designed into a role. And so one of the things I think it's important is when we think about unique genius, don't just think about unique genius in the terms of skills uh, or things that you're good at doing, but, but think about it in terms of this, these, this purpose, passion, and place, the people that you're going to do it with. And, uh, and then when you get in a role, now you design your role with this genius in mind. And, and that's a very different approach than just designing it with the need of the organization in mind. And, uh, and I think you got to do both, but that's really what this is about. So what does engaged employees look like, right? People where their energy is engaged. There's some good Gallup uh, research out there. 50% post, you know, messages and pictures about their, uh, about their organization on social. Uh, 33% share unsolicited positive praise or comments. 24% boost sales uh, from, you know, uh, the, this engagement. And we even have more. This comes from some data that uh, is kind of international data when it talks about organizations where they have high level engagement, two and a half times uh, greater revenue growth. Uh, some of some recent stats came out with saying that earnings per share were 150% more than normal uh, than their competitor organizations. Even talks about less accidents, less uh, absence, more, lower turnover, uh, even this, high, this idea of net promoter score, it's a 24% increase in net promoter score. So these are just little reflections on, and I don't even think this comes even close to what can really happen in an organization when it's designed around a genius, but when people are beginning to be engaged, when they feel involved, when they feel meaningfully engaged, uh, I think you see this uh, as a part of that process. So as I end with all of mine, if you've been to my uh, webinars before, I love Rilke and, uh, and I love this quote. And, and for me, it's not about 
um, trying to find the answers. It's about asking deep questions. And, um, and the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps someday in the future, you'll gradually, without even noticing it, live your way into the answer.